Hey there, this is Dane from FeatherProp.com. Thanks for joining me here today. This video is part three of a series that I'm doing on baptism. If you haven't seen the previous videos, then you may want to go back and check them out first to kind of get a feel for what we're talking about here today. Now, in today's video, I want to discuss the proper method of administration of baptism. In other words, how do we do Christian baptism? If someone converts to Christianity and desires to follow Jesus, how do we go about baptizing them? And that's what I want to try to take a look at today in this video. Now, in my first video on baptism, I discussed the differences between John the Baptist's baptism and Jesus' baptism. And this is an important distinction, and so I kind of want to touch upon it here once more. Now, I believe that Christian baptism has its roots in the Old Covenant. In other words, Christian baptism is the fulfillment of, the, of an Old Covenant type or shadow. And I've read some commentators who have tried to find its beginnings in some of the ritual washings of the Old Covenant, for example. Now, as I said, I believe that it has its roots in the Old Covenant, but I think many Bible teachers have been looking for it in the wrong place. Baptism's foreshadow is found in the Old Covenant, but it's not in the pages of the Old Testament. It's in the New. John the Baptist was the last great prophet of the Old Covenant. Jesus said the law and the prophets were until John. I take that to mean that John was at the end of the line of the Old Testament prophets before the New Covenant was inaugurated. Now, John offered his baptism, which was for repentance, but uh, even he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So John seemed to recognize that Jesus' baptism was going to be fundamentally different than his own. It was as if John was saying, mine is to water what Jesus is to the Holy Spirit. And as I pointed out in the part one of my videos, whenever Christian baptism is mentioned, it is never mentioned as being baptized into water because that was John's baptism. Rather, it's always being described as taking place into the name of Jesus Christ or the name of the Lord Jesus or into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy uh, Spirit. Now, it would seem obvious to me that water is being de-emphasized just as John had predicted. Now, I'm not suggesting that water isn't used in Christian baptism. Instead, what I'm saying is that the focus is not water because it's a spiritual event, not a physical one. Just like 100% of all the other shadows and types of the Old Testament, which are fulfilled in the New, this one is also spiritually fulfilled. Water may symbolize what is happening, but we aren't being baptized into water. We are being baptized into Jesus. I don't think a reading of the New Testament could lead us to any other conclusion. So how do we baptize someone into Jesus? Well, I think we first remember that it is Jesus who is doing the baptizing. John said, he will baptize you. Now, of course, the church is the body of Christ, and so we become his hand, so to speak, even for baptism. But how? Well, there are three methods commonly utilized by various churches to baptize. First, there is something known as sprinkling. This is where the one who is officiating usually dips one of his hands into water and lays that wet hand on the head of the person being baptized. Churches that practice infant baptism generally use this method for all of their baptisms. Then there is something called pouring. This seems to be popular among Anabaptist groups. In this method, the one officiating takes a pitcher or basin of water and pours it over the head of the one being baptized. And finally, there is full immersion. This method calls for a large body of water, or at least large enough to go into, like a lake, a swimming pool, or a baptismal tank. The one officially usually dips the candidate under water for a moment until they are fully submerged and, if everything goes to plan, will lift them back up again. And these are the three main methods and they, that are generally and hot, uh, actually hotly defended by the groups that employ them. Also in dispute is how many times a person is immersed or poured upon or sprinkled. Do we do it just once, or do they go into the water three times, one each for the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Another matter that is contested among those who immerse is, do we dip them backward into the water or forward? So you see, there are a number of different considerations to make, and Christians seem to find plenty to disagree with in this matter. Now, it's my opinion, based on my study, um, that the amount of water used and the method employed is probably more important to us than it is to God. 
Remember, Christian baptism is being baptized into Jesus. It's a spiritual event. Now, that being said, I personally prefer the method of immersion because I think it powerfully demonstrates being buried with Christ, going into the water, and being raised in new life with him, coming up out of the water. However, I have to admit that I have never baptized by the method of pouring, and frankly, I'd like to give it a try someday. I think that it may powerfully represent the Holy Spirit being poured out on us. You know, let me briefly describe my own story to let you know where I stand. In 1976, I was 13 years old and made a decision to join my local United Methodist Church. I was at that time baptized by my pastor. Now, the only method offered me at the time was sprinkling. I was pretty uninformed at the age of 13, and so I didn't dispute what was happening. However, I have a feeling that if my pastor had asked if I would rather be immersed, I'm pretty sure I probably would have taken him up on the offer. It would have been kind of fun to see him in swimming trunks. In any event, at the age of 13, I stood in front of my church, confessed my faith in Christ, and was water baptized by sprinkling. Although I have not been completely obedient to Jesus since that time, I have been walking with him all of these years. I have watched as both the fruits of the Spirit and some gifts of the Spirit become manifest in my life. These have testified to me that I am in fact attached to the true vine. I have never doubted that I was not in Christ. Now, years later, I would become active with a congregation which is part of the Restoration Movement, a congregation known for its very firm stance on water baptism. I know that there are many at the church who felt that I was not only not baptized, but not even saved because I had not been immersed in water. But I knew that what God had done to me in 1976 took. I knew that I had truly been baptized into Jesus because I saw the fruits of that in my life. Yet, sadly for many, it was not enough that I was immersed into Christ. They needed me to be immersed into water. Now, I find this unfortunate because it's an emphasis on the water, not on the spirit. And I know that there are many Christians today who still emphasize the amount of water, how that water is to be applied, and how many times that water is used. But I believe that Peter warned against this attitude when he wrote that baptism is not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but, I, but that I believe what he means is that water itself has no particular saving properties. Rather, he said, we are saved by the answer of a good conscience toward God. In other words, Peter insists that it is not any outward application that saves us, but it's the inward answer to the call of God in our lives. So you see, it's my study of the Scripture which has led me to become less focused on the physical outward matters of baptism and more focused on the spiritual aspect of it. I see immersion into Jesus Christ as being more important than being immersed into water. Well, I'm going to end this video right here. In my next video, I want to discuss the controversial matter of being baptized into the Holy Spirit. I hope to see you then.